on this Monday night, your health in the heat. We have to drink water, a lot of water. The dangerous conditions and the warnings about this summer's forecast and beyond. Ukraine and Russia's historic grain export deal halted. The domino effects and what Ukraine's president is now pushing for. The fight against this frightening looking vampire fish. The lampreys are slimy, resilient beasts. How the pandemic spawned an invasion of this invasive species in the Great Lakes. And buzzkill. The unintended consequences of the Save the Bees campaign. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with the suffocating heat, shattering records and smothering much of the world right now. In the U.S., Phoenix has been 43 degrees Celsius or hotter every day for more than two weeks. In Japan, authorities have issued heat stroke alerts in more than half of the country's 47 prefectures, with temperatures hitting 38 degrees in some areas. China recorded its hottest temperature ever on Sunday at 52 degrees. And in North Africa and Southern Europe, the mercury is soaring, with Italy issuing hot weather red alerts for 16 cities, including Rome. The World Meteorological Organization says the Mediterranean heat wave is expected to intensify this week and could last further into the summer. Jackson Prosco now on the dangerous heat, leaving this planet in uncharted territory. They came for a glimpse into the past. Across Europe, tourists are now sweating through a moment in history. No. We expected heat, but not this hot. Il problema. In Italy, officials warn of a critical situation in the coming days as temperatures surpass 45 degrees Celsius. It's the same story in Spain. The hottest weather I've been, it's in Madrid. <laughs> and Croatia, where the beach provides little relief. Normally we are at, uh, in our room because it's too hot. The UN's World Meteorological Organization warns the heat will intensify <laughs> and could become entrenched across Europe through August as climate change amplifies a warmer El Nino pattern. I think this is a glimpse of, of what we can expect more, far more of in the future, um, not just through El Nino, but obviously in the longer terms with, with climate change as well. In the United States, a sweltering summer is already baked in. One third of the country is under some kind of heat advisory. Miami recorded its first ever excessive heat warning. It's actually not safe at all. While Phoenix reached a record 18th consecutive day above 43 degrees. If you ever like stood next to an oven while you're baking something, it's like that, but like it's coming from every direction and you can't escape it. Temperatures like these are incredibly dangerous in any location and can lead to serious illness and death. Humans have to regulate body temperature within a very narrow range. Heat can accumulate and then reach those levels that are really incompatible with, with good health. What's happening now is seen as a warning of a sweltering summer ahead, one where records are likely to keep melting away. As the weather nudges toward the extremes, scientists say that many of these temperatures would not be possible without human-made climate change. They say what we're seeing now aligns with predictions for what a warming world looks like. Farah? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thank you for that, Jackson. Now, those extreme temperatures are fueling wildfires around the world and here at home. There are nearly 900 fires burning in Canada, with roughly half of them in British Columbia, and many of them were started by lightning. More than 100 are burning in Quebec. Drifting smoke from those fires has triggered air quality advisories and even blowback into the northeastern U.S., prompting air quality alerts for millions south of the border. Unseasonably hot and dry conditions means this year's fire season started early, and it's showing no sign of slowing down. 10 million hectares of land is burned so far this year in Canada. Now that's larger than the area of New Brunswick. And as Mike Armstrong explains, it's a new record and one that's still growing. Quebec's premier toured outside the village of Normetal Monday. Among the sites he stopped to see were the massive fire breaks outside the village, trees that were cut down to keep wildfires from spreading. 
Last month, the town had to be evacuated when flames came within 500 meters. The Premier now says the province is looking at permanent fire breaks around other northern communities. We are still studying and trying to evaluate what are the risks for the next years. Now, in most of the regions in Quebec that were hit hard in June, things have improved. But trouble has moved even further north. Several Cree communities have moved out vulnerable residents. Fires are cutting off access by road and smoke is a problem. There is also a major fire believed to be bigger than any in recorded history in Canada. Fire 218 east of James Bay has burned more than 8 million hectares. You know, almost 40 degrees today, the wind's blowing. British Columbia is right now the hardest hit region in Canada. There are more than 370 fires burning as the province struggles with extreme drought. BC has requested federal help. The Canadian military has teams on the ground assessing what's needed and what it can do. It will be uh, coordinated between the province and the federal government and also in terms of what's happening in other parts of the country as, as well in terms of the resources that are available. There have now been firefighters killed in this wildfire season. A young woman lost her life in BC last week. Another person was killed working in the Northwest Territory Saturday. There has been record-breaking destruction and heartbreaking loss in a wildfire season that's just starting. Mike Armstrong, Global News. Protesters marched to Parliament Hill today to show their support for those in Manitoba blocking a landfill as they demand for the site to be searched for the remains of murdered Indigenous women. Enough is enough. It's not just words anymore. We need action. Family and friends, along with First Nation leaders across the country, are outraged over the provincial government's decision not to search the landfill. But as Marnie Blunt reports, the blockade remains despite a court injunction to remove it. A flag is raised and stands tall alongside protesters as they continue to hold their ground near a Winnipeg landfill. I feel like the world is watching. It doesn't mean that we can just call that a victory and go home. It means that we just have to continue screaming louder and get more attention drawn to what's going on here. This about three days after the city of Winnipeg was granted a court injunction to have the blockade removed. <laughs> On Friday, that very injunction was burned on the spot during tense moments among protesters. But the protesters say they want to remain near the Brady Road landfill peacefully, with some saying this is part of a healing process. For those women that lay in that landfill, they need to hear our dresses. They need to hear our drums. They need to know they matter. They need to know we care. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs speaking out Monday alongside family members of Morgan Harris and Mercedes Myron, along with a panel of experts who say the landfill can be safely searched, calling for action and answers from the Manitoba Premier. They are not garbage. Yet they are being treated like garbage left in a landfill site. No proper burial, no closure for the family. The Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs called on both the provincial and federal governments to work with them to find a way to bring the missing and murdered women home to their loved ones, adding that they're not asking for a complete search of the landfill, but rather the specific area where the remains are believed to be. Farah? Marnie Blunt in Winnipeg. Thank you, Marnie. Russian President Vladimir Putin is vowing to respond to a deadly overnight attack on a vital bridge that links Russia with occupied Crimea. Russian officials have released this video, which shows the aftermath of what Putin calls a terrorist attack that killed at least two people. Moscow's blaming Kyiv and claims both British and American officials had, quote, direct participation, but has not provided any evidence to back up those claims. Ukraine has neither confirmed nor denied responsibility. This marks the second time in less than a year that a bridge has been hit by explosives. And just hours before it was set to expire, Russia's confirmed it will not renew the Black Sea Grain Initiative. The unprecedented and breakthrough wartime deal allowed grain to safely flow from Ukraine to other countries for the past year. And as Redmond Shannon explains, the suspension won't only hurt Ukraine, but food prices worldwide. 
The TQ Samson arrives in Turkish waters, the last of 1,100 shiploads under the Black Sea Grain Initiative. The year-long deal expired Monday, Russia confirming it will no longer guarantee the safety of grain carriers leaving Ukraine's port of Odessa. I deeply regret the decision by the Russian Federation. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres says he made assurances to Vladimir Putin after the Russian president demanded restrictions on Russia's food and fertilizer exports be relaxed. That despite Russia's grain exports rising since it invaded Ukraine last year. Guterres says he will keep trying. There is simply too much at stake in a hungry and hurting world. Many poor nations like Somalia rely on a stable supply of grain from Ukraine. A spokesperson for Ukrainian leader Vladimir Zelensky says he wants Black Sea exports to resume even without Russia on side. But that will make shipping insurers think twice about the security risks. The threat could come from a, a frigate or a destroyer or other warship, or it could come from an unmanned uh, surface vessel. Mark Gray is a maritime security consultant. He says a Navy escort or patrol would be needed to protect grain ships from any Russian threat. The Russians would want to make this very deniable. A missile is probably a, a good method of doing that because they could fire a missile and then claim it was a mine. NATO member Turkey helped broker the deal. If its navy ended up engaging Russian warships, NATO could be drawn perilously closer to a direct war. The more likely option for now is to divert exports via land through Romania and Poland. An extra cost which will get passed down to consumers who can least afford it. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. An invasive species lurking in the Great Lakes. Coming up, how the pandemic spurred the population growth of sea lampreys. Of all the fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic, the last thing most people would think about is the ecosystem of the Great Lakes. For decades, an invasive species has been kept under control until the pandemic caused those measures to be reduced. Erica Vella explains why we're seeing more of the vampire-like sea lampreys in our Great Lakes and what's being done to stop them. It has a snake-like body and suction cup mouth stacked with rows of sharp teeth. Inside, there's a file-like tongue in the middle that flicks out and drills through the scales and skin of the fish, and then it feeds on the fish's blood and body fluids. The sea lamprey is like something out of a horror film, feasting on the fish of the Great Lakes. The fish is native to the Atlantic Ocean. They spawn in freshwater rivers and streams, but they eventually found their way into the Great Lakes, first documented in Lake Ontario in 1835. By 1938, they were established in all five Great lakes destroying native fish populations. The use of lamprecide along with other control measures had reduced population by nearly 95 percent, but... The lampreys are slimy, resilient beasts that will uh, take advantage of relaxation and control and balloon out of control again, um, given the chance. The COVID-19 pandemic saw the relaxation of some of those measures. Lake Erie and uh, Lake Michigan, we saw a doubling in the lamprey numbers, and we saw a, a significant jumps in Lakes Huron and Ontario, um, and we saw a large jump in Lake Superior. And it could have devastating ecological and economical impacts on the Great Lakes. They're just able to kill 40 pounds, I think, of fish in their 12 to 18 month feeding period. The fish in the Great Lakes are often unable to su survive the sea lamprey attacks. Gaydon says while this spike is concerning, work is underway through a binational sea lamprey control program to manage populations. We're cautiously optimistic that while these numbers are high and economically and ecologically damaging to the Great Lakes, that they're also going to be um, temporary blips in the numbers. With the hopes that in years to come, Lamprey will once again be reduced to pre-pandemic levels. Eric Avella, Global News, Toronto. Honoring history ahead, the Métis community trying to take back the land of their former village.
The North American Indigenous Games are officially underway in Nova Scotia, with the opening ceremony being held last night, which included a not-so-warm welcome for Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Trudeau getting booed as he helped kick off the festivities, but it was a friendlier greeting today for the Prime Minister as competition kicked off. Around 5,000 athletes, coaches and mission staff from 756 First Nations across the continent are in attendance. It is the first iteration of the game since 2017, with the last one postponed because of the pandemic. Every July, for the past 30 years, hundreds of Red River Métis make a pilgrimage to a field in southwestern Manitoba. They're mostly descendants of what was once a thriving village until the government ordered it burned to the ground in 1938 in order to use the land as a community pasture. Now, it's a little-known bit of history, which is something the Métis want to change. Melissa Ridgen takes us to St. Madeline, Manitoba, where families gather to feel a sense of community where their former village once stood. The reminders are still here, hiding and grazing in plain sight. You can't get to St. Madeleine without passing by. I don't think many Manitobans or even Canadians know of this story, where cattle were more precious than human beings and meaning the Métis people. They graze here, where 35 Métis families once lived. There was a church and a school, a community. All that's left today is the cemetery. At that time, families used to move, like they used to follow each other, they used to go dig in Seneca roots. The Métis laboured for area farmers in the summer, returning to their community in the fall. And when they came back in the middle of October, their house was already burnt down and uh, their dog was shot right here. Their entire village gone, families scattered throughout southwestern Manitoba. We had to rebuild, to rebuild with whatever they had. Also, area farmers had a place to put their livestock. When you drive in here and you see those cows, how do you feel? Mm. I'd like to have some steak. <laughs> in 1990, children of St. Madeleine residents decided to gather every third weekend in July to celebrate their culture and share their history. Kim Smith is an organizer. It's really sad watching all the, all the campers. Sorry. It's sad because and you don't know what's going to be back here for a year, and this land is just wasted. The goal, having the land return to the Métis. Just yesterday, I was coming over here thinking, maybe one day, maybe one day my grandchildren will be able to live here. Do you ever think about getting this land back? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Constantly. Um, I don't know if we'll ever get it back. Or if, like others, the only way she'll get to stay here is at rest. This is where my husband is. And that space where you're standing, my dear, is my spot. <laughs> the Manitoba Métis Federation has lobbied the province to sign over the land and clear the way for descendants to come home and rebuild this community. Or at the very least, memorialize the site. The Métis never give up. And so from my perspective, uh, we will get this land. I've been speaking to the Premier on this matter. We're, in my view, close. Premier Heather Stephenson's office confirms that talks are ongoing to give this land back to the Manitoba Métis. But time is ticking down to an October an election, one that the NDP opposition is favoured to win. We asked them if elected, would they give this land back? They didn't respond. Melissa Ridgen, Global News, St. Madeleine, Manitoba. I'm Crystal Gamansing. We've all heard the rally cry that we have to save the bees, but it turns out humans might be causing more problems. I'll explain coming up on Global National. For years, we've heard the slogan, save the bees, and it's clearly worked, resulting in a honeybee boom in many parts of the world, like in London, which now has the densest honeybee population in Europe. But as our Europe Bureau Chief Crystal Gamansing reports, it's also led to some unintended negative consequences. So we're going into Hive 8. For nearly 20 years, Dale Gibson has lived and breathed honeybees, creating a sustainable data-driven business he says led by his bees. Well, this is a, a, a 14 by 12 hive, so it's quite a big size hive, and it requires around 250 kilos of nectar. 
That nectar is needed to survive the winter when the bees cluster together. They don't hibernate. They also need 50 kilograms of pollen. Think about a kilo bag of flour, yeah. and then you have to take 50 of those as bees and bring them into your hive just to survive for the year without creating a surplus of honey for the beekeeper to take. Is that why when there are so many of them they don't thrive, is they're just not able to find enough nectar? Absolutely, not enough nectar, which is, nectar is their carbohydrate. London has the densest honeybee population in all of Europe, leading to a rise in diseases. Plus, their overpopulation means other bee species and pollinators don't have enough food. The population boom can be traced to the Save the Bees campaign and the honeybee colony collapse in America. Although you have good intentions, you're causing the opposite of the benefit to biodiversity that you're hoping to achieve. Like the UK, Canada did not experience colony collapse disorder. It was kind of a US phenomenon. There is colony decline and Paul Kelly, a Canadian honeybee researcher, says it's around 35 percent per year. But because beekeepers manage colonies and can divide them, they can rebuild the colony numbers. Pollination is required for a third of the crops eaten in Canada, and of that, Kelly says 80% of the work is done by honeybees. Whether in Canada or the UK, planting bee-friendly flowers, trees, and shrubs is the best way for people to help all pollinators. Crystal commands in Global News, near Whitham, England. And that's Global National for this Monday night. I'm Farah Nasser. On behalf of our whole crew here, I want to thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is the Vermilion Lakes near Banff, Alberta. We love seeing Your Canada, so please keep emailing us your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Until tomorrow, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Good night.